We launched uh, in the middle of the night, on a night when, uh, when we were kind of wondering whether we were going to go fly or not. Uh, we finally got to go ahead and suit up. This is my favorite piece of gear to put on. Um, very, very comfortable. Uh, here's Borneo putting it on his suit for his first flight. You see John uh, Grunsfeld on the right. Everybody's raring to go. Uh, we had a sort of a, a marginal call from the weather guys, uh, for those of you that followed it. Uh, Sam on the left and Ron on the right. We're all kind of thinking that uh, this is sort of a dress rehearsal for the real launch day, which would probably be the next day. Tammy putting her suit on and Wendy. Suit Tech's did just a marvelous job. Um, I think we may be one of the last flights that actually wears the LES as we get ready to go into the ACES suits. But um, we were all fired up and ready to go, and lo and behold, we went to fly. Here we are, starting the main engine seven seconds before launch. Of course, a little over a million pounds of thrust there. Two SRBs, you see the twang maneuver, and Steve in the left window, two SRBs lighting, and basically four and a half million pounds of weight and eight million pounds of thrust pushing us upwards. Instant daylight. Obviously, you can see how well we illuminated things. John and Wendy were able to actually see the launch pad, the smoke plume, and the coast by looking back through a mirror. And uh, obviously, a majestic sight for everyone as we quickly disappear from sight here. And approximately two minutes, we approached the SRB SEP, which, of course, gave us a beautiful view of the forward rockets as they separated inside and we were on our way to orbit. Well, here we are, a little over an hour into the flight, just uh, witnessing this beautiful view of the Earth. But flight day one is extremely busy, and so we needed to get to work. We opened our payload bay doors a little over an hour into the flight. And then soon, we'll be uh, activating our Space Lab pallet and uh, activating our instrument pointing system, all of which is done from the aft flight deck. Once we attach our telescopes to the instrument pointing system, we deploy that uh, IPS and instruments to the upright position. And then a little bit later on, we'll be doing a thorough checkout of the IPS um, and also a checkout of all our ultraviolet telescopes in preparation for the next 15 days of astronomical observations. Um, on the, from the left-hand side, I work the IPS side, and Sam on the right-hand side is uh, doing the, inst the instrument checkout. We were able to very quickly settle into the routine. I was responsible for making sure the orbiter was pointed at the right part of the sky. Tammy was responsible for fine-tuning with the instrument pointing system. And then the telescopes would lock on to the target. And you might be wondering why we're looking at the Earth, but we're currently rolling to the right attitude. The idea was that we would pick up a star as it rose above the Earth's limb. And then Sam would go to work, making sure the experiments were ready to start the observation. And quickly, we have the Astro Star Tracker on the left. UIT, Hutt is right in the middle. And Whoopi is on the right-hand side. A very, very capable package of telescopes. It really did an outstanding job. We had a number of tools on board to help us uh, evaluate how we were doing. We communicated to the telescopes primarily through the small laptop computers. Um, I'm issuing commands directly to the telescope, and you saw Tammy issuing commands to the instrument pointing system. Um, this is what we would see through the Hopkins Ultraviolet Telescope. It had a TV camera that actually looked out through the telescope, and here you see an acquisition of the planet Jupiter. We're actually looking at the space around Jupiter. And displayed below that was a spectrum that we're actually acquiring. Um, here you see the Wisconsin ultraviolet photopolarimeter experiment in the foreground. And this is the type of image we would get from the WIPI instrument. This shows a star um, in the acquisition camera. And in addition, we had the spectral data from WIPI also to evaluate the target to make sure that we were looking at the right target and the data was good. Well, what ended up being a very, very short checkout period, um, we got into the routine of observing target after target for 
for the uh, rest of the mission. John and I were the redshift um, uh, back end of the bus operators with uh, Borneo in the front, and we uh, would do a Borneo would do a maneuver of the orbiter. John would maneuver the IPS to the correct attitude and turn the manual pointing controller over to me after the IPS maneuver was done, and uh, I would do the the uh, target acquisition on the CCTV displays, and uh, the telescopes would be set off on their way uh, observing the, the object. And here again you see the CCTV displays that we had on board to make sure we had the right target. This information was also available to the, all the scientists on the ground, and there was a huge team working at Marshall, as well as all the folks here at Mission Control working. And here we see our uh, alternate payload specialist, Scott Rongen, and we were in regular communication with the APSs and the other folks at Marshall working the telescopes. Every day they'd send us up uh, a few pages of, of new information <laughs> on new targets and, and target procedures and also all the orbiter uh, procedures and information. And so that was uh, part of our duties on board to incorporate that into the Rolodex. And uh, Tammy helping me out there. That was uh, part of our daily activities. We also had, uh, as I mentioned, the Mid-Deck Active Control Experiment. And uh, here you see it uh, with the disturbance at the far end on the right there, disturbing the whole structure, and that's free-floating or near-free-floating the mid-deck. And in just a second, you'll see the control take over, and the left-hand gimbal suddenly locks in, even though the right hand is still disturbing. And this was the way it worked most of the time, quite well. Uh, here's a case where the left-hand side is supposed to be pointing inertially in space, but obviously uh, this is a uh, oscillatory divergent case where the control wasn't quite enough. And you wouldn't, if this were a space station, I don't think you'd want to be aboard. Uh, <laughs> and, and these were fun to watch, but by far the minority. And this was a, just a great interactive experiment, as you can see by the expression on uh, our commander's face and uh, <laughs> Borneo build to the left there. Fortunately, the other mid-deck experiments were rather benign. We just spent most of our time cleaning the filters on the protein crystal growth experiments. You can see John here participating in a medical DSO. It was determining the uh, function of the eyes and the head, your gaze on orbit. He's definitely wired for sound in this scene. And again, Dr. Sarex, also known as Ron, uh, talking to with, uh, with one of the many school contacts. We spoke to schools literally around the world, India, South Africa, uh, as well as throughout the United States. That was really, again, as John said, one of the more enjoyable aspects. And of course, we'd had to include Bill on the bike uh, he had to arm wrestle the rest of us for time, though. He didn't live on the bike. We actually made him work. But it, as I said before, it was a great way to get some exercise and to relax while you're on orbit. Well, that exercise is likely to make anybody hungry, and some of us were hungrier than others. As we see, uh, Borneo here was first in line at the galley. Uh, Redshift usually had dinner together. We usually had a, a cocktail hour first where we all had a shrimp cocktail. Here you see a... Uh, a, a blue shift uh, person coming in here probably didn't have enough breakfast trying to <laughs> get somebody's food away from them. And of course, playing with food, you know, no matter how often <laughs> your mom told you not to play with your food, it's just impossible not to do that in space. And uh, you see Tammy here with a uh, uh, fluid physics experiment, uh, some uh, tropical punch floating free in the mid deck, which she was able to uh, vacuum up post haste. And of course, we don't have a shower on board, and that's the best you can do. Earth observations, as we said, was one of the more enjoyable things to do and also an important part of the shuttle program. And here is uh, Wendy's famous uh, Barren Island volcano uh, in the Andaman Islands. And uh, that was neat to look for that kind of stuff. That was uh, a great discovery for us to be able to report that to the ground. Again, Shark Bay, uh, this is a, a larger view of it. And from day to day, we could see variations, both due to tidal differences and also from the rain in Australia. Uh, this is looking towards the south. Up at the very left end of the picture is Adelaide and uh, some of the dry lakes in the Air la uh, Lake region. Uh, and some of these also had water in them. And uh, we had both uh, color visible film and infrared film. And we took uh, sometimes pairs of pictures of the same region. Uh, we also had an opportunity on a number of passes to see the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, Tammy showed you the Oahu view. Here's an, uh, the big island of Hawaii. And uh, on the top of the picture there uh, on the volcano are a number of NASA observatories that also do astronomy. And uh, we really enjoyed taking the pictures. 
This is another uh, beautiful view of a sunset on orbit. It takes about 90 minutes to orbit the Earth, and so one gets to see a sunrise or sunset every 45 minutes. And uh, this is one of the storms that we witnessed in the south central United States. You're looking uh, north is at the top of the screen. Uh, to the left, you can see Louisiana all the way up to Atlanta, actually. And on the right-hand side, of course, is Florida. And it's a very graphic depiction of city lights and storm activity. Eventually, we have to come back home. This is a graphic visualization of the pilot DTO. You can see uh, an actual approach here on the computer screen, working with the uh, controller, which is mounted to the existing stick on the orbiter. In addition to that, prior to coming home, we went ahead and did a check on the flight control systems. And what we do is we do a, a check of all the jets and also the flight control surfaces to make sure that the orbiter does perform as advertise and here the three orbiter folks Steve, Wendy and myself are going through the flight control system checkout and you'll now see the Elevon moving in the background and you can really feel this just shake the vehicle as it slams back and forth against the hard stops. And then the uh, final step before we come home is to turn the orbiting observatory back into a flying machine. And it gets kind of hectic there when we're trying to pack everything away and uh, then put our launch and entry suits back on and uh, get ready to re-enter. Here you see uh, Ron and I and our Suits or Us uh, logo there, <laughs> putting Borneo in his suit. Uh, once that's done, then just before we deorbit, we close the payload bay doors, and uh, seal the payload bay so that we can re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. As you're probably aware, we were um, originally scheduled to land uh, at Kennedy Space Center on the 17th of March. Uh, which would have been 15 and a half days on orbit. Unfortunately, the weather in, uh, in Florida didn't accommodate that landing, so um, we put the telescope away. Uh, never did actually close the doors. The Mission Control Center folks never put us into the suits because the weather was, uh, was so bad, we did, they didn't think that we had a chance at it. Uh, the next day, uh, Saturday the 18th, uh, we made one look at uh, the Kennedy Space Center, waved off on the first rev, uh, and went ahead and burned to uh, Edwards Air Force Base on the second deorbit opportunity on the 18th. Uh, there you can see the hack. Uh, we're on final now into runway 22 at Edwards. And um, the winds were a little bit gusty at, at Edwards. Uh, you can see a little bit of the dust coming off of the lake beds, but, um, but there wasn't an appreciable amount of turbulence. We could feel uh, a little bit of turbulence on final, uh, and the uh, right to left crosswind was definitely noticeable, uh, but nothing that wasn't well within the uh, performance capabilities of the orbiter. And uh, for those of us that have flown before, uh, there wasn't a whole heck of a lot of a dif difference between uh, an eight-day to 10-day flight uh, and a 17-day flight. So um, if there is a limit uh, on the amount of time that people can go to space and come back and land an orbiter, uh, we don't think it's at the 17-day point. Uh, it was a wonderful flight. Uh, we had uh, an orbiter that gave us virtually no problems whatsoever. Uh, the folks down at Kennedy Space Center uh, should be very, very proud of the orbiter that they gave us. Uh, we hope that we gave it back in pretty good shape to them uh, so that they can turn it around for the next bunch of folks that go fly it. Um, it was a tremendous adventure for us. Uh, we were very pleased with the results. Uh, I had a, a tremendous group of people to go fly with, uh, exceptionally talented group of folks. Some clip of the activities of STS-71.